Um, thanks everybody for coming. I wasn't expecting to see the room this full, so this is pretty awesome. Uh, the, the class you're in is called uh, Beyond the Chips, and we'll talk a little bit why, I'm, uh, why I called it that. I'll give you a little bit of information about me. My name is Kevin Olinkson. Um, it's a pretty traditional role of you know, mechanical design for, for uh, a degree. Uh, along the way, I worked in some different shops doing like metal fabricated components and CNC uh, machining, programming, that kind of thing. And I've also worked for an autos reseller in the past where I did a lot of the technical sales and training and tech support and all that kind of stuff. In 2015, I decided to kind of go out on my own and kind of do my own thing. I'm in a company called Mechanical Advantage. And um, one of the main places I go, he's in the audience today, is to NYC CNC. So once every couple of months, we go and do training classes there. Um, if anybody would like to get a better hands-on idea of doing CNC machining, we'd love to have you come and take one of our classes. And you can find all the class information at myccnc.com for that. Uh, one of the other things I get to do is I sometimes get to work with the autodesk education team to go to colleges to work with some of the professors and things like that. To, uh, professors and students to kind of bring fusion, you know, get them using the CAM side. So the picture that I have here is actually in the NYC CNC shop, and it's one of the education managers that I'm taking the picture with here. So kind of a fun little shot. Okay, so. The idea behind this class is we're all CNC programmers or the people who are doing CNC programming and we focus so much on tool paths and like living in the CAM environment and thinking all about that, that we don't think about all the other parts of Fusion and what it can do for us to aid in the CNC programming. So that's kind of some of the stuff that we're gonna look at today during this class is what are the things that we're ignoring or not focusing on as much that can help do our CNC programming faster? Uh, so, a couple of points here is because we live in the CAM environment, that's the workspace we switch to all the time. We switch to the workspace and we think about CAM and the setups and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes we go to design, you know, do some drawing or some different work in there. But one of the other CAM, uh, environments that is a good place to go take a look at is the patch workspace. So we're going we're gonna to take a look at the, what we can do in design and what we can do in patch, now called Surface, and the new user interface. So one of the first tools I wanted to talk about inside of Fusion is the ability to direct edit, which means that the files you get don't have to come from inside of Fusion. You can kind of work with them from any CAD system. Um, one of the things that's kind of famously happens with engineers, I know it's kind of a joke, people say like engineers should have to take a test before they're allowed to use the fillet and chamfer command because the fillet and chamfers are really cool to look at, but they can make programming CNC parts a lot harder. So me as a programmer, I might want to get rid of those fillets and chamfers, and um, if I don't have the history to do that, you know, how do I do it? In Fusion, we'll see that it's a fairly simple, straightforward process. Uh, we can also use this direct uh, modeling capability. You'll see an example that I have where I take a mill turn part. Maybe we don't all have mill turn machines, but we might have a lathe, we might have a mill. So can we take a mill part and turn it into a lathe part? Um, kind of use that along the way. So we'll take a look at that. And uh, we can also modify geometry using push-pull or by using the find feature command. So I've got some uh, little videos that we're going to take a look at here to, to see those. So in this case, uh, this is that mill, part I was, mill turn part I was talking about. I'm going to copy the body and then repaste it back over the top of itself. So now we have two of the exact same solid uh, in the same location. And I'm going to rename one of those files to be mill and I'm going to name the other one to be lathe. So now I'm going to go and shut off the, uh, the mill part and just work with the lathe part. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to click on the hole, right click, and say delete. And there it goes. It goes away. I'm only wrecking the copy, not the original now. So I'm going to kind of speed this up at this point, and I'm just going through and uh, just clicking on the different features that I want now. And I'm just going to hit the delete key, and they're going to go away. So we're going to start to defeature the model. Um, I'm just looking for anything that wouldn't be a lathe feature and just deleting it off. Uh, so Fusion is, it's, this is super powerful in this program to be able to kind of do this kind of stuff. Like we get used to it in Fusion, we forget how not easy this is in the other systems that we've used in the past. So now I need to get rid of some more features and I'm going to go to the selection menu and there's a kind of a cool selection feature we can do called a freeform selection. So I can draw a window around the bounding box of the area that I want to delete. So I'm just dragging a window around that and then hitting the delete key. So we're kind of defeaturing more of those things that are on there. 
So the next feature I need to get rid of are kind of those little, I don't know, angled pockets that are on there, what I'm clicking on there. Now I could probably have used the window select feature for this as well, or freeform, but it's pretty simple to click on the faces and just start clicking on those features and getting rid of them. So just continue to, to go around. Now I've sped parts of this video up, but the total time for me to take this model and to feature it was four minutes and 20 seconds was the total time to get that back into kind of like a, a lathe profile that we could start with. Now I'm just gonna click on the remaining faces that I need to get rid of here. And as I do that and hit the delete key, it heals itself and starts to form. So hopefully you can start to see the lathe part, the lathe stock start to appear from the mill part that we want to end up with. Um, again, I, I could have used that freeform selection to probably make this even faster if I would have done it that way. So we're getting pretty close to having this done. A couple more faces to select on and get rid of. <clears throat> and once we get all these faces uh, deleted, we'll be able to switch over to the manufacturer workspace and um, do some work with this. And so now I'm just gonna turn that mill part back on so you can kind of see how the two kind of fit over the top of each other as an exact copy. I'll we'll switch over to the manufacturing environment. And now instead of specifying my stock, I'm just gonna say I wanna do it from a solid, I'm gonna expand out my bodies, I'm gonna choose that lathe profile that I made. And now Fusion knows exactly where the stock is and where the part is, and it was a pretty quick and simple way to reverse back to a lathe part from a uh Oh, did, okay. So that's kind of the first example I had for you there. Uh, so here's another one. This is just a, a kind of a dummy uh, step file that I imported. And what I want to do is be able to modify some of this geometry, but I don't have any history with this. So I'm going to do this in a couple different ways. I'm going I'm to use the same command for it, but in a couple different methods. Uh, from the create menu, I'm going to use the find features. And I'm just going to say, okay, Fusion, find everything for me. I'm going to draw a window around it. And when I hit okay, in my browser now, you'll see that it went through and automatically found features. So there's fillets and chamfers and holes and things like that that I can right click on and now I should be able to, there you can see the fill radius I came up with. I could adjust that and change that without having the history. What I find I have better luck for with is to, instead of choosing everything, just choose the things that I want Fusion to find at the time. So here I'm gonna say, okay, I want Fusion to find these holes for me. When I click okay, it goes through and it finds those holes as features. I'm gonna do the same thing with the fillets on the part and then I think I do the same thing with the chamfer going around the outside. So the more complex the part is, the, the harder Fusion's gonna have of a time finding features based on like extrusions and things like that. So I generally find I have better luck to just try to make it pick the things that I want to be able to change along the way. And then there's that last uh, kind of chamfer. I'm just grabbing it as one continuous face around there. And then over on the browser, once I make the selection, you'll see that that chamfer appears over there as well, something I can edit. So really pretty neat tools for being able to go and find some uh, things that you can edit when you don't have the history behind it to do it. Okay, how many of you, I know some of you guys were in largest class today, how many of you are using parameters in your models? Good. Um, I'm embarrassed to say that as an inventor user, I probably used an inventor for almost five or six years before I even knew there was such a thing as parameters. And in a design, uh, once um, we had like a kind of a library part and we could change three dimensions and it pretty much updated an entire assembly. And I was like, well, where, where's this been? So I want to talk a little bit about parameters and hopefully give, give you guys a little insight of how they work and why you might want to use them. So what are parameters? Parameters are pretty much any number that you type into Fusion while you're using history and Fusion is tracking onto those numbers and there's remembering it and you can always go back and make your changes. Um, we have two different types of parameters. We have model parameters. So as you're sketching or you're making an extrusion or whatever you know, those kind of values are, those are model parameters that you're entering in. And Fusion's just always kind of uh, tracking those. And then we have another set of parameters called user parameters. These are parameters that we make that we've linked to other things. And we'll see a better example of using these down the road. But I want to start with a pretty simple example of um, how do you use, or what are parameters and how do you create them? So I'm just going to sketch a simple rectangle. And when I drag this rectangle out, I'm going to give it a couple dimensions. And then when I'm done with this, I'm going to hover my mouse over the top of it, and you'll see that it's called a very helpful dimension of D1 and D2. And pretty soon you end up with D73 and D87, and they don't really mean anything to you anymore. 
So what I'm gonna do is change parameters now, and inside of this model, there's only gonna be two parameters. There's my, my D1 and D2, they're not very helpful, but I could rename those parameters as something like width and height that are more useful names to us that we can start to remember what they do. So make those change. I'm gonna go back and edit the sketch, and now when I hover over those values, they're no longer D1 and D2, they're width and height, so they're things that start to make more sense. So basically that's what parameters do and we'll see how we can use those in a more powerful way when we get to this vice example that we're gonna do here in a little bit. So I'm gonna extrude it again. And when I extrude that, I extrude it at one inch. I'm gonna go modify my parameters one more time. I'm gonna go find that extrusion. Uh, and I'm just gonna give that a more useful name of thickness. Now the other cool thing is, if you guys been using Fusion, you know that you edit a sketch and then you edit a feature and then you edit another sketch and you edit another feature along the way. But from the parameters menu, we can edit them all at the same time here. So we don't have to go find all the individual sketches and features, we can do it right from the same window. So I think, uh, yeah, so now I just go and edit the parameters and kind of move things out of the way a little bit. And you can see from here, I can go change any of those values without editing the sketch or the, the extrusion just by changing their values and seeing them all update at the same time. So this is generally kind of the way that I start to explain to new users what parameters are and it kind of gives you a pretty simplified way to kind of see like, oh, okay, I, I think I see what they do. <clears throat> okay, sorry about that. All right, <clears throat> another workspace that we have access to that it doesn't really seem like as CNC programmers would do us a lot of good, it's the patch workspace. So the patch workspace is intended for the purpose of service creation. However, as CNC programmers, we can use it to do things like block off areas where we, want, where we don't want the tool to go, or to extend tool paths to get farther off of parts so we can kind of get a better quality service finish. A couple tips and tricks we'll see in the video is that service patches try to be uh, tangent to the solid body. And sometimes, like you're gonna see there's a top face and there's side faces and it gets confused about which surface it tries to be tangent to. So when we run into that issue, we can create a copy of that as a surface, the, the face is a surface, and then we can make a tangency to that surface body instead. So uh, here I am in the, let's switch over to the manufacturer workspace, and there's a parallel tool path on here, and if we look at it, the parallel toolpath is dropping into those little holes there, and it's dropping in little pockets. And even if we, you know, even if those are all hogged out, we probably would still want to just ramp the tool all the way across rather than lifting and going across all the way. So what we can do now is we can switch back to the model. I'm going to go to the surface, and I'm going to create some patch surfaces. And most of the surfaces on this part are pretty easy to patch. So I'm just clicking on the patch, and then I'm right-clicking and saying uh, repeat, and that finishes the last one and gets you in a new one. It's a little shortcut to get into the patch environment when you do this. So I'm just clicking on these holes to patch them so that I can stop the tool from going in there later. So these are planar, they're just circles, they're easy to do, it's, the software's not having any issues with it at all. When we get to these center patches, the face is kind of dished, and so it has to try to figure those surfaces out. And you'll see on this first one, uh, when I hit OK here, I'm gonna go highlight the surface and we'll look at it from an end view. And that probably is not what you were hoping to see right there, how it's kind of sticking up. It, would it work for probably what we're trying to do here? Maybe, but I think we can do a better job. So I'm gonna delete that surface, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, um, yeah, I tried some. I tried to change the continuity of it, but it, did, it made it worse. It actually, see how that's even a worse result than what I had before? So I'm gonna delete that surface off. And then what we can do now is, I'm gonna do as, it's called an offset surface of zero inches. So it's gonna be an exact replica of that face right there. And then if I turn off the body, uh, I'll turn off those little patches there first, and then I'll turn off the main body. There you'll see that's an exact copy. Now I'm gonna go patch it. And if I drop it to G2, uh, we can repeat that process for the same ones. And I keep changing the uh, service condition for each one of these. We'll go grab that last one as well. When we look at this from a straight end view now, 
it's exactly what we'd expect. It's that flat surface. So it, it didn't get confused about what surface to be tangent to anymore because there's only one surface for it to work with. So when you run into that situation at times, that can help you get you out of a jam. So we made the surfaces great. Now what do we do with them? So we need to uh, get back into our model. And I turned too many bodies off here, so i got to turn one more back on. The surfaces don't need to be on for us to use them. We just be able to need to select them out of the browser. So I'm going to go edit that parallel toolpath. And the trick for this is on the, on the geometry tab, you have to check the model checkbox. And then you have to tell Fusion what other, what other services it has to honor. So I have to go and click all those services that I just created so that it honors those in the calculation and it won't penetrate through that surface of the tool. will just ride on the top then at that point. So we're almost good. Hit OK. And now you'll see that the tool paths no longer dive into the pockets. Instead, they're riding across those areas. So pretty simple little uh, trick for, for figuring that out. So that's one of those, you know, the patch environment at first doesn't seem super intuitive for CAM, but we use it a lot in that respect. OK, uh, another thing we can do, joints. I, I come from a constraint world. I was an inventor person for a really long time, so it always took us three constraints to lock something down. And I really like joints. Like, when joints work, they're awesome. But when you don't have the right geometry to align with, they're kind of a pain because you got to kind of figure out how much do I need to offset it and drag it and do different things. So what we can do inside of Fusion is we can create something called the joint origin. And joint origins can be, they can be calculated from a point. They can be a sketch point. They can be based on different things. So we'll take a look at how we can uh, create that joint origin. And they're kind of, like I said, a, kind of half of a joint and that you can easily locate things to later on once you create them. So here I, I have a, a vise and a machine table. And what I want to do is locate this somewhere so that we could bolt this onto the table. And it, Fusion's really good at finding like the endpoints and midpoints and center of faces, but I need to find something in that slot, and there's nothing for Fusion to lock onto. So what I'm kind of forced to do is figure out, like, well, how far would I have to pull it back to get that lined up? And then how far do I have to offset it? And I'm doing kind of the math to think about that. And, I don't want to think about it. I just want to get my programming done. I want to get my stuff located as fast as I can to get that done. So I'm going to take and put a little work up front to get these joint origins placed so that later on I can just grab a vise and slap it onto one of those joint origins that's already pre-created. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to create a sketch on one of these faces. I'll just delete my sketch off there, uh, the, the projection. And then I'm just going to drop a work point in. And then I'm going to project that work point in, or the, the origin point, I should say. Now I'm going to draw a work point, place it, uh, align it using a, a constraint, and then dimension for it. Now, the dimensions I'm using are pretty much worthless. It's more to show you the workflow about how you might do this rather than to get it done properly. But so I just offset that by a certain amount. And so now I can go to my assemble and choose join origin, and I can choose that sketch point to locate that joint origin at. So now I know I've got that thing located exactly where I want it. I can turn there. You can see you can change the, the angle of the joint origin. You can also offset it left or right if you wanted to, or forward or backwards, up or down. You can kind of have complete control of where you want to move that joint origin. The point of it is you want to get it located once so that you can reuse it over and over and over and over again. Um, while this is kind of playing, how many guys are using vices when you're programming parts right now in your setups? Anybody? Yeah. So I think we'd all like to use it, right? But it's kind of a pain to get them set up and get them, you know, it's more effort than what it's worth. So the, the point of this is let's figure out how to do this smart one time, and then it'll be a lot easier to use down the road. So there you can see I just uh, applied it to that joint origin, and it's located based on that. Now, I, like I said, I didn't locate it properly, but you can see how you can, you could put as many of these joint origins on your setup as you needed to, so you can just drag and drop whatever components and place them where you want them to go. OK, so what I'm going to do for a lot of the rest of this presentation is I'm going to go take a Kurt Vice from their website, and we're going to take the dumb solid, and we're going to turn it into an intelligent feature that's really easy to use when we're done with it. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to download the file. Now, most vendors will have their files readily available for you on their website. They want you to use their stuff, so they want you to go and grab it, and you know, you're going to be more likely to buy it that way if it's easy to access. 
Uh, Fusion can work with a wide range of files. So kind of my favorites are to either work with a native CAD format if you can get it. And if you can't get it, uh, step is kind of my second favorite method to work for, uh, file type. When you get step files, there's sort of two standards. There's AP214 and AP203. And if it's my uh, preference is always to get the 214 if, if available. They seem to just work a little uh, more cleanly if you have any issues. Another tip for you, if you go to your manufacturer's website and they don't have your vice or component or whatever you want to put in your setup available, um, call the vendor and ask them, like, hey, can I, get, can I get this from you? And if you can't get a hold of them, call your sales rep because um, they want to sell you more stuff and they're, they're more apt to keep you happy and they can probably get a hold of somebody and get you the files that you need for that. Okay, so we're going to look at the process here. I start by going to the Kurt website and I just go find one of their product lines. Um, in this case, it's their Anglock vices, I guess, and it's their DX6 model that we're gonna choose from. So I'm just gonna go out here, grab that, and uh, on the Kurt website, they have like a little uh, picker thing you can go through. So I'm just gonna go down here and say that I'd like it to be in step format, so I'm gonna choose the step option. I don't want it zipped, so I'm going to uncheck that. And then just to show you that they offer theirs in uh, two versions. So I'm just going to download that file. And now it's on my computer, my downloads folder. So the next thing that we're going to do is we, we download it. Now what do you do with it? So Fusion can open some files directly. It doesn't need any translation. It just goes and does it. .f3d files are one of them. Step files, that's one of those things. Other files need to kind of go through a translator to be converted to a Fusion file. But the good news is with some of the recent updates, you don't really have to know that. You just try to open it. If it can open it well, if it can, it runs into the translator and presents it back to you. So it kind of automates the process along the way. Um, if you try to upload a file to your data panel, so if I took a step file and uploaded it, it's going to convert it to a Fusion file for me as well. Once we sort of get that file open, you're gonna see me do this in the video part coming up. First thing we wanna do is save it. Once we save a file, Fusion starts an autosave sequence, so it starts to track our work as we're going. You wanna give it a name. Um, companies in general are, at, it's hard to get standards in place so that people kinda of name things the right way so people understand what it is. I really encourage you guys to figure out how are you gonna name things when you, when you get these things? You know, like what's our naming convention? Are we gonna go with the manufacturer's uh, model, are we gonna call it generic, you know, six inch, five inch, whatever, how are we gonna name this stuff? And then be consistent with how you, when you start doing that, have everybody do the same thing so everybody sort of understands the naming structures of what you're working with. The other thing we have to think about when we open this file is, do we wanna work with history or do we wanna work with no history? And you're gonna see for the majority of me uh, working with this vice, I don't wanna work with any history because I'm gonna do things like, rotating and moving and doing different things just to get a position, and I don't really want to track that. That doesn't really do me any good. It just kind of clutters up my, it clutters up my timeline. So I'm gonna work with a lot of this as no history, and then we're gonna turn history on when we need it. When we open this vice file, you're gonna, you know, the, the different things you're gonna open, they're either going to be components or they're gonna be bodies or combinations thereof. Um, in this case, when I open this one up, it's gonna be all bodies. Um, so when you do your moving and things like that, you have to understand, what am I moving? Am I moving bodies? Am I moving components? Because you're gonna have to select the right entity type to be able to move them. And it's also a pretty good idea before you start doing very much work that you do a little investigation on that file that you just downloaded because translated files often have issues with them. There might be a surface body in them or a gap or something that didn't come across quite right. So you just wanna take a little inventory of the model and the, uh, your bodies to make sure that they're all showing up as solids and not surfaces. So we'll hop over into Fusion again. And I'm just gonna go file open here and we'll browse to where that uh, vice file is that I just downloaded, and I'll click the open button. Now when I open this up, you're gonna see that it came in the wrong orientation from where I probably wanted this vice, which is no big deal. Um, and there we open up and we see that we're all bodies. Everything in this file is listed as a body. Body one, body two, body three, body four, body five. And so I'm gonna go ahead and save this as whatever I wanna name it. 
I'm going to go ahead and save it. That's going to start my save sequence uh, going. And I'm just kind of looking right there going, oh, nope, they're all solid bodies. We don't have any services. So we all got pretty good quality right there. And now I want to start working on the orientation. So I'm going to use the move command. And I'm just going to draw a window and everything I want to move. It's set to bodies right there. So that's what I want. And then I am, I'm going to use the rotate function. So I need to specify an edge. And then now I'm going to rotate the model by uh, negative 90 degrees to get it in the orientation that I want that way. It's still not quite where I want it. I'm going to move it a couple more times. So I'm going to go back into the move command again, just drag a window on everything. Now, I might have been able to do multiple moves at the same time, but um, I'm just going to do them one at a time. Rotate that negative 90 again to get the front aligned with the front of the view cube. And then the last thing, this is kind of personal preference, but I'm just going to pick a spot that I'm going to move to my 0, 0, 0 point inside of my model. So I'm just going to uh, do a point to point move this time. And I'm going to choose that center circle at the very bottom. And then I'm going to expand on my origin folder. I'm going to click on that 0 and go ahead and click OK. And now the vise moves to that uh, origin point. And so I've got that thing kind of located in the space where I want it. OK, so I'm going to clean some things up in here. Now, uh, all the hardware is on here, like all the bolts and nuts and things like that. And you guys can decide, like, do I really do I need the hardware? Like, can I get rid of it? Can I combine it? Do I, do I want it? Is it going to do any value for me? Is it geometry that I want to keep, or do I just want to get rid of it? So I'm going to delete those. So there's um, some socketed cap screws that are on here that are duplicates. And I just want one that I can, I'm going to pattern as a component or replace as a component. So it's that component one, instance one, instance two, instance three, instance four. So if I change one of them, they all update at the same time. Uh, another thing I'm going to do is there's a little support and there's a shaft that goes through this. And they don't really add any value to kind of keep both of those components in the, in the browser at the same time. So I'm going to combine those just so I get the overall geometry rather than have those two components in my tree. And the last thing I want to say is your goal for this is to have an envelope of the vise. You're not manufacturing the vise. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, as CAD people, we always want everything to look as amazing as possible, right? We want the thread profiles. And, but our goal here is, hey, we just don't want the tool to hit the vise jaws when we're done. So we're back into Fusion. And so I'm just going to kind of go through, I'm just kind of clicking on each one of the bodies to figure out what it is that they are, what, what do those things represent. And then eventually I'm going to get to some of the hardware where there's uh, multiple pieces of. So there would be the second one. So I can just go to my right click and delete that, or just hit delete on the keyboard and start getting rid of those components. So I want to clean up the duplicates that I have on here. And you'll, you'll, it'll make more, uh, more sense once we get a little farther in the process. OK. Then um, I see that part that I want to combine. So I'm going to isolate it. And then I'm going to try to figure out where that shaft is. I'm going to delete the, that center circle out of there. It doesn't really need, you know, we just want the overall envelope of it. And I'm going to go through and find that shaft. There it is. And now from the modify menu, I'm just going to use the combine command to combine these two pieces into one. I was hoping when I got done with this, I could unisolate the part by right clicking on this part and doing that. But Fusion got a little confused about what the body was that was isolated because it combined with the other one. So I just had to manually go back and turn the light bulbs on, not the end of the world. So now we got kind of the, the parts in this vise sort of cleaned up that way. OK, so now um, we're going to do some renaming of bodies and components and things like that. And a couple things to keep in mind here is that you can't add a joint to a body. You can only add joints to components. So right now what I have in my file are all bodies, so it's not going to do me a lot of good until I make them components. Um, so I put a question here, should I rename them now or rename them later? If we rename the bodies now when we create them to a component, they're going to inherit the body name when they were created as a component. So um, might want to do it right now. And then again, does the naming matter for what these components are? So again, we're not manufacturing these. Uh, is the name really all that critical? You want to decide how your company wants to go about naming these things. And the name typically isn't very important in this case. What I chose to do with this file is I looked up the Kurt website in their manual, and I just named the things what they were called in the manual. That way, if we ever hit one or damage one and need to replace it, we can just go, oh, I, I need another one of these part numbers. So we're back in Fusion. 
and I'm just gonna start slowly double clicking. I might go a little faster on this because I think I took a long time typing this out. But it's find the components and I just started renaming them to what they're called in the curve manual. Going through and, and taking care of that. So I'll jump forward a little bit here. And just go through and rename them. And that should do it for that step. Okay. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna create components from those bodies and we can, we can highlight all the bodies at once and right click and make them all components at the same time. So that can save us a little time instead of doing one by one. And I also kind of like to like group them together and group them in a logical way when I create the components. So after I create them, I probably want the vice body to be the very first thing, not the, the cap screw or something like that. So I'm gonna go through um, and kind of group those things together and then I'm gonna re-add those, the hardware files that I've deleted, like the socket to cap screws and things like that. I'm gonna re-add those back in as components so that there'll be the, their multiple instances of them. And when I put them in place, I'm gonna use either the joints or the align command. You could do either one. But when I'm done with it, I'm gonna delete all those joints away again. Once I move those bolts into place and I delete them, because I'm not capturing history, they're not gonna return to where they, were, where they started from. They're just gonna be put in place and then later on we're gonna use a different uh, system to kind of lock them down in place. So we're back in Fusion. We're going to go find uh, the first one and the last one, right click and say create a component from body. Now when I did that you can see all the bodies, all the components took on the body names automatically. So getting that step done renamed everything. I'll probably make this step go a little faster too because all I'm going to do is start copying and pasting in and relocating the hardware where it wants to go. The main reason why I did this, this might be a little on the OCD side, is just to go through and make sure that the, the bolts are instance one, instance two, instance three, instance four. Um, obviously these, this hardware in here probably doesn't uh, matter a whole lot. So we'll jump forward a little bit, get to the good part. Yeah, we can go a little bit more. So I'm just using the joints to place them. And now that I got them all in place, I'm just gonna expand out. I'm gonna organize things here a little bit, I guess. And then I'm gonna go to the joints folder and I'm gonna delete all those joints back out of there. So there's my joints, just click the first one, last click, right click, say delete, they're gone. Again, my history is not on yet. None of these things I'm doing is being tracked. This is just for me to kind of organize and get my file laid out. Okay, so again, uh, I'm gonna organize the browser. I'm gonna keep like things by like things. I had some difficulty with this. I couldn't get, I couldn't get all the bodies to go one, two, three, four. Some, go, some of the hardware goes one, three, two, four, something like that. I couldn't get them pulled around to, to match. Doesn't really matter, I quit trying, because it's not that big of a deal. Um, and then uh, one of the other things I like to do when I'm making these vices is I move everything to the closed position and then I, st uh, then I you know, just to get it back to the zero, zero spot to start from. When we move again, when we move them, you'll see that I have to make sure that now I need to move components instead of bodies. So I have to be careful about what it is that I'm moving. And I need to know how far I need to move it. So I'm gonna use the measure command to measure to see how far that is. And instead of writing that number down, I'm just gonna copy it. So we'll jump back in. And we're getting close to the, to the really good stuff in here now. So I, uh, I start out just by organizing some of the stuff. I'm gonna put all the hardware at the end. I guess another thing I should mention about this is this process is a little bit tedious, but we're gonna spend a half hour to do it now so that for the rest of the time, we just insert this in and make some changes and our vice is done. So it's one of those, it's a pretty powerful tool once you get it done. It doesn't really take that long. I think I can do this in about, I think I can do a, a vice start to finish in about 20 minutes now to get it fully parametric and set up basically from any manufacturer. The process is pretty uh, similar. So I got things kind of uh, organized here. I might jump forward just a little bit. Yeah, so now I'm just gonna start the measure command and find out how far is it between these two vice jaws. And then I copied that number and I'll just use the move command and click on a component at a time. I've got Jeff in the back of the room. Can I move multiple components at the same time using the translate command? Yes. It wouldn't let me. Uh -uh. 
So I, so I had to move them one by one. So uh, as we were going through, it would have been nice if I could have picked all the components at once and did it, but I, I couldn't get it to work out on this particular one. Okay, I'll bring my file. So there, there I've, I've taken uh, almost all the components. I got one more to go. And I've kind of got everything to the closed device closed position. The main reason I might want to do this is if I don't want to control this with like a piece of stock and I just want to go to parameter and, and set like a minimum and a maximum, I want my minimum to be zero and my maximum to be whatever that value is that this can open up. And it's just easier if that number is zero rather than some negative number at that point. Okay, so now uh, I've got a bunch of parts that are on here, but they're not fixed in place yet. So a couple ways we can kind of fix them is we can add joints between things or we can do a rigid group. The benefit of rigid group is it's really easy to say this part and this part and this part and this part all belong together, they're kind of glued together. And you can grab multiples at the same time. Once I get the rigid groups created, we're ready to start making the assembly and when you do an assembly inside of Fusion, you want one component that can't move. So we're gonna take and we're gonna fix one component in space. And there's two ways we can do that. There's a recommended way and there's the less desirable way. So the less desirable way, let's get that out of the way first, is to right click on a component and say ground. And when we ground it, uh, everything, it won't move in that particular file. Once we insert that file into another file, it's free to move again though. So if we do the uh, as built joint as a rigid joint between a component and the origin folder, it will behave the way we want it to in the next file that we use it to. So that's kind of my recommendation of the method that you guys want to use when you do this is an as built joint and kind of skip the rigid uh, making a part, sorry, making a part fix, not rigid. So we're back in Fusion again, and now I'm just gonna go through, um, I'm gonna start capturing history at this point as well. Now, all the things I do, I want to be able to go back and be able to fix it if I make a mistake. So up until now, everything I've done has just been for organizational and kind of whatever purposes. Now I care that if I make a mistake, I can go back and change it or edit it or do whatever. And I started a rigid group and now I'm just selecting the things that I want to belong together that are gonna be kind of glued together in one shot. So, uh, and I think I stop a couple times in here, so I'm just gonna jump forward a little bit. So I'm just kind of going through my browser and trying to figure out what things should belong to the group that can't move. And then I've got that taken care of. And we're gonna do one more rigid group, and we're gonna go and select all the things that we think should be part of the group that does move. So part of the sliding jaw, the hardware, the jaw, um, all that kind of stuff that would go along with that. And we'll go and select those things as a rigid group. I'll just jump forward a little bit. Okay, so now we're ready to go and add an as-build joint. So I'm gonna choose as-build joint, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose the vice body. That's probably the most stable part in the origin. We're gonna see the part kind of shake for that rigid joint. Now that vice body is fixed in space and no longer can it move. Um, all the parts that are rigidly joined to that can't move. The only part that should be able to move now is the part that would be able to slide. However, it doesn't know how to slide yet because I haven't told it how to slide. It can just move anywhere in space. So we're gonna work on that part next. Okay, so we're gonna work on our slider joint. Now, um, I'm gonna add a slider joint between the two jaw plate faces. And I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna use the browser tree to my advantage here. Uh, I have two coplanar faces and it's hard to select them both at the same time. So I'm gonna turn the visibility one off and then turn the visibility the other one off so I can make the selection of those two parts easier. You're also, I, I, I guess I have a note, if, uh, I said it earlier, if I didn't want to control the jaw opening with a piece of stock, if I just wanted to set what that number is, when I do my slider, I like to see the number get positive and negative, or I'm sorry, positive to zero, instead of, uh, instead of being negative when it opens up, because then it's easier to set my joint limits that way. And that, um, so Jeff's helped me out as well with that. Uh, the order that you get those things to select to make one positive and one negative is kind of a little bit of a voodoo dance that you have to do, but eventually you can make it work out. So everybody here remember Windows Vista back in the day? Cancel or allow? Well, um, whoever came up with that campaign got a job with the Fusion team and he came up with the capture position or continue. How many people have seen that message as they're working inside of Fusion? How many people know what that does? Yeah? Yeah, so, so here's my recommendation for you. I, I work with a lot of people um, that will do like a little one hour session with me because their models are not working very well. And the first thing we open it up and there's like 72 capture positions in their timeline. 
and they don't realize that when they capture the position that Fusion is tracking the moves of all the components as, as, everywhere you do that. So it just starts to stack up and slow it down and slow it down and slow it down. Um, so my recommendation is if you're not specifically intentionally meaning to capture the position of a part, if you just moved it and now you go to another joint or do something and it comes up and says, do you want to continue or capture position? Capture position is the first choice, so people usually go, I don't know, just get out of my face, I'm going to capture position. That's not the answer you want. You either want to continue or use the revert on the uh, toolbar, and you'll see me do that coming up here. So now I'm going to turn off one of the vice jaws, and we're going to go and we're going to do a slider joint. I'm going to pick some arbitrary face, I'm going to uh, place on that face, I'm going to choose the center of one and I'll turn off the, that visibility and turn on the other one, and then I'm gonna choose the same corresponding point on the other uh, face. So Fusion chose a rigid joint to start out with, and I'm just gonna say I want it to be a slider. Now when that number just animated right there, it was positive, that's what I was looking for. I want to see that number being positive. And I can turn my, my uh, visibility back on, and now you can see I have the workings of a vice jaw. So we're opening and closing, and everything's starting to work the way I want it to. When I stop moving it, I'm just gonna hit let me back up for a second. There is the capture position to revert. I always want to revert when I'm doing this, unless it's my intention. You're going to see in a little bit, I want to capture the position, but almost always I want to revert. So it looks like our vice jaw is kind of uh, functioning the way I want it to. So now comes the, uh, the fun part again, parameters. Remember we talked about two parameters earlier on, model parameters and user parameters? So now we're gonna make a bunch of user parameters. I kind of rehashed what parameters are here again. We're gonna make a bunch of user parameters that are gonna control the width, height, and thickness of our parallel and the width, height, and thickness of our stock. And we're gonna create an X offset um, parameter as well. When we create these user parameters, they don't do anything. You can make as many user parameters as you want to, and they don't do anything until you connect them to something else to make them do things. So these parameters, you can make as many as you want. They're going to be useless until you kind of...